But it's my pleasure now to welcome the panel on to the, st the stage for the, the next session, which is what can you do to tackle modern slavery risks? And I'd like to welcome Professor James Cockaine and the panel. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, Orb, and thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure to be here and to, uh, to be with you in person, as has been said. I'd like to begin with a, a thanks to the organisers, Orb in particular, but everybody who's been involved in putting this event together, and, and a thank you also for giving this topic such prominence. Uh, I'd also like to be begin by acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we're holding this conference and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that the modern Australian economy and indeed the modern Australian financial system was built in considerable part by handling the proceeds of forced labor of First Nations peoples in the pastoral economy, the domestic service economy, sugar industry, mining industry, fishing industry. And I, I want to acknowledge that not to make any political point, but, but really for two reasons. First, to make clear that modern slavery, forced labor and human trafficking, including labor trafficking, are quite ubiquitous. They're not an abstract idea. They're present in our supply and value chains. The ILO estimates some 40 million people worldwide in all countries, not just in developing countries, but in all countries are subjected to modern slavery. And, and secondly, to make clear these are financial crimes. The, the conduct that makes up modern slavery is a predicate crime that triggers anti-money laundering obligations. So when we are exposed to deposits or transactions connected to conduct that amounts to forced labor or modern slavery, there are anti-money laundering obligations triggered. And that's really what we're here to discuss today with you. We have a fabulous panel that I look forward to introducing you to in a moment. Uh, I'm going to begin, though, by asking uh, if we could bring up Ambassador Lucien Manton, Ambassador for People Smuggling and Human Trafficking, uh, who I believe is dialing in from Canberra uh, for the opening. Yes, there she is. Good morning, Ambassador Manton. Can you hear us Good all right? Good morning. Yes, well. Great. We can hear you. I'm going to give you the floor now. Thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to your remarks. Over to you. So thank you so much, uh, James, uh, and uh, good morning, panel members, Alex, Sarah, and Lisa, and participants. I am pleased that you have included the very important topic of modern slavery, slavery in this inaugural anti-money laundering and financial crime conference, Australasia. Modern slavery is an important issue that encompasses a number of crimes, including human trafficking, forced labour, debt bondage and child labour. Modern slavery crosses borders and touches all parts of the globe. It affects some of the world's most vulnerable people. As you've just outlined, according to the 2017 Global Estimates produced by the International Labour Organization, or ILO, and Walk Free, represented here today by Lisa Singh, an estimated 40 million people are victims of modern slavery and human trafficking globally. And sadly, women and girls are overrepresented, making up more than 70% of victims. We know anecdotally, with some statistics now coming through confirming that COVID has increased the risks of exploitation for those most vulnerable to being a victim of modern slavery. No country is immune, including Australia. And we have risk exposure to modern slavery around the world through our increasingly complex business supply chains and the goods and services we use and consume. So I am pleased to have the opportunity today to talk about what we are doing here in Australia and how we are working regionally and globally to address these issues. As I've said, modern slavery can occur in any industry, any sector, making it so important that government, business and civil society work closely together to address these crimes. We know that awareness of this issue is growing in governments, the private sector and consumers around the world. 
but we also know that awareness, understanding and a willingness to act is not universal. Neither government, business, international organisations nor civil society can address it alone. So first, let me outline some of the actions the Australian government is taking to eliminate modern slavery. The Australian government established the Modern Slavery Act in 2018 to drive private sector action to combat modern slavery in the supply chains of Australian goods and services. The act was the culmination of the work of many, including in the Australian community and business, looking to address these crimes. The Act aims to drive private sector action to combat modern slavery in the supply chains of goods and services in Australia by increasing supply chain transparency. Under the Act, large businesses and entities operating in Australia must report annually on their actions to identify and address modern slavery risks in their operations and supply chains. These reports are published online at the Australian Government's online register of modern slavery statements. They can be found at modernslaveryregister.gov.au. Already the register hosts the statements of more than 2,700 entities. This disclosure-based system creates a practical risk-based framework for transparency that supports businesses to respond to modern slavery and increases information available to consumers and investors. The Act is increasing awareness of modern slavery risks that businesses in Australia face in their global supply chains. It also requires the Australian Government to report, with the first statement published in December of last year. The statement took a targeted risk-based approach to addressing and assessing modern slavery risks in our supply chains and operations. The statement focused on four high-risk sectors, investments, textiles, procurement, overseas construction, and cleaning and security services. As a result of the Modern Slavery Act and media attention on it, there is also increasing awareness among civil society and consumers of their power to drive change. The publicly available reports provide a window into domestic and global supply chains for Australian consumers and civil society. Underlying the structure of the Act is an expectation that businesses submit robust and comprehensive statements and that those that do so will gain reputational rewards. Conversely, businesses that take a minimum compliance approach may find themselves exposed. Australia recognises that no single country can tackle these issues alone. Australia continues its long-standing engagement with partners in the region to help build and strengthen legal and policy frameworks to counter trafficking and forced labour. In the Indo-Pacific region, Australia and Indonesia work closely together as co-chairs of the Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. A regional platform for policy dialogue, information sharing and practical cooperation on these issues. It includes 45 member governments comprising source, transit and destination countries for irregular migration and four UN organisations. In 2017, recognising the importance of raising awareness within the private sector and engaging with business to tackle modern slavery, the Bali process launched a government and business forum. This forum brings together ministers and business leaders from Bali process countries to increase awareness of the problem and develop innovative strategies to tackle it. For example, focusing on supply chain transparency ethical employment and safeguards and redress for victims. I would like to thank Walk Free for its very valuable work as the Secretariat of the Government and Business Forum. In September last year, the forum held an online session focusing on the finance sector. It was moderated by our moderator here today, Dr. James Cocaine. The session highlighted that considerable work is being done by many parts of this diverse sector including investors, stock exchanges and pension funds. 
The session also highlighted the importance of supporting victims and survivors and ensuring their insights inform our work. Human trafficking as a form of modern slavery is estimated to be one of the most significant generators of criminal proceeds in the world. In 2014, the International Labour Organization, or ILO, estimated that forced labour generated over 150 billion US dollars in illegal profits each year. A significant proportion of the proceeds from modern slavery is transacted and laundered through the financial system. Financial institutions can, therefore, play a vital role in helping to identify trends that may be linked to money laundering and or modern slavery. Through suspicious matter reports, financial institutions can assist Austrac and law enforcement agencies to identify potential illegal activity and to detect illicit financial flows. This engagement is crucial to track and seize the profits of modern slavery. The finance sector also plays an instrumental role in fighting human trafficking and labour exploitation. As an integral aspect of business operations, any changes financial actors can make in their investment decisions or in how they deliver financial services to address risks of human trafficking and related exploitation can have a considerable impact in other industries. Australia is working with the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiative, known as FAST, to engage with the finance sector regarding the tools available to address these issues. The FAST initiative was established to support the implementation of the recommendations of the Financial Sector Commission on Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking, which Australia's Foreign Minister co-convened with counterparts from Liechtenstein and the Netherlands. We are also looking at opportunities to promote and implement the recommendations across the region, including through the Bali process. In April this year, Australia's Foreign Minister co-convened with her Spanish counterpart a meeting of women foreign ministers to discuss the gender implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and girls with a special focus on their vulnerability to trafficking. At the meeting, ministers endorsed the recommendations of the Financial Sector Commission's 2019 blueprint for mobilising finance against slavery and trafficking and discussed implementation in their respective regions. Ministers also discussed the importance of taking a victim-centred approach to ensure that victims and survivors are supported and their experience informs our responses to modern slavery. In conclusion, we all have a role to play in eliminating modern slavery demand for human trafficking and forced labour. There are a number of ways we can do this. By acknowledging the problem, recognising that no country is immune and no business is immune, and that we all need to work together to eliminate these crimes from global supply chains. Success will require a response built together with business, civil society and international partners. Everyone here has a role to play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Manton. As you can all hear, the, the Australian government is clearly very active and committed to efforts in this area. And you may be thinking, well, what does this mean for me as a compliance officer or as someone involved in anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing work? It's worth pointing out uh, that the recent uh, efforts by Austrac involving uh, alle alleged violations of anti-money laundering obligations by Westpac also related to conduct uh, that technically falls within the definition of human trafficking. It wasn't framed as such, but there seems little doubt that the online sexual exploitation aspects of that of the underlying conduct was part of what gave the issue such visibility publicly and gave it such uh, attention in, in the broader community and potentially, arguably, uh, from the regulator. So it's clear that this, this is not just a, a foreign policy issue, though clearly, as Ambassador Menton, you, you've outlined so, so helpfully, uh, there's a great deal happening in Australia and the region to promote collaborative efforts by government and the industry, but also real attention from regulators. 
So that probably begs the question for you, what can you do to tackle these risks? And that's, that's what we're very much here today to discuss. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Manton. I think we're going to let you go now. And we're going to throw instead to a video uh, produced by ACAMS and Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, the initiative that Ambassador Manton just mentioned, was promoted by the foreign ministers of Australia, Liechtenstein, the Netherlands, and now also Norway. Uh, it's a video about a training certificate that is available for anyone online, free, on the ACAMS website. So I'll throw to the video now and it will explain. ACAMS Risk Assessment offers financial institutions worldwide a standardized means of measuring, understanding, and explaining their money laundering risks. And based on a methodology designed by public and private sector industry experts, it delivers a comprehensive, automated risk-based profile of an institution's products, customers, and geographies through a platform that is scalable to institutions of all sizes, from community banks to global financial institutions. ACAM's risk assessment goes well beyond simply providing risk rankings. The scalable solution offers a holistic view across multiple... So I encourage you to take the ACAMS Risk Assessment course. That is not the course to which we we're referring, nor in fact the video to which we we're referring. But perhaps if our, um, our colleagues on the technical side can find the video, we might come back to that a little later. But I think without further ado now, we'll move on to the fabulous panel that we have to help you answer this question. Uh, what can you do to address modern slavery risks? So allow me first to introduce the panel. Uh, we have a great lineup today. Uh, on my right, your left, uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah McGrath, uh, who is the Director of International Engagement, Business and Human Rights at the Australian Human Rights Commission. At the Commission, amongst other things, uh, Sarah oversees the Commission's Modern Slavery Strategy and Projects. She returned to the Commission in July 2018 after spending nearly three years working at the forefront internationally of business and human rights issues at the International uh, Corporate Accountability Roundtable. Sarah, great to have you with us. Uh, after Sarah, we'll hear from Alex Coward, who has kindly dialed in from Canberra. Uh, Alex is advisor at Pillar 2, but in a previous role in Canberra, Alexander led the development and implementation of Australia's landmark Modern Slavery Act, which you've already heard referred to, uh, including leading the national consultation process to develop the act, authoring the government's official guidance for reporting entities, and establishing the online register modern slavery statements that you heard Ambassador Manton refer to. So Alex, thanks so much for being with you, with us. We look forward to hearing from you shortly. And finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Lisa Singh, Head of Government Advocacy at Walk Free, the Mindaroo Foundation. Uh, some of you may know Lisa from her previous incarnation as a senator uh, from 2011 until 2019 for the great state of Tasmania. Uh, she was the first woman of South Asian heritage to be elected to the Australian Parliament and as a senator played a key role in the development of Australia's Modern Slavery Act. Uh, and Lisa and I share one thing in common, which she probably doesn't know yet, uh, and perhaps some of, we share this in common with some of you, which is that we have ancestral connections to people who were in indentured labour, well, in your case, indentured labour, in my case, indentured servitude, uh, back in the old country, as they say. Um, so practical experience here. I'm sorry to say that Siobhan Tuhill from Westpac sends her apologies due to a family medical emergency. But without further ado, Sarah, I'm going to come to you, uh, getting down to the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, earlier this year, the Human Rights Commission published a really helpful practical document entitled Financial Services and Modern Slavery, Practical Responses to Managing Risks to People. So let me ask you, where do anti-money laundering and anti-financial crime measures fit into those practical responses? Great. Thanks, James, and thanks, many thanks to ACANS for the invitation um, to be here. I thought it might be just helpful if I briefly explain who the Australian Human Rights Commission is because many of you might be wondering, what are you doing here at a financial crime conference? So for those that um, are unaware, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission is Australia's national human rights institution. So we're an independent statutory body charged with the promotion and protection of, of human rights in Australia. Um, we have a number of um, areas of priority that we focus on, but one of those is looking at the intersection between business and human rights and the global economy and human rights, which is how we 
the perspective, I guess, that, that we bring to this conversation. Um, as Jane's mentioned, we released um, uh, guidance for the financial services sector earlier this year, and this is the second in a suite of sector-specific packs that we've developed um, with KPMG Australia. Um, the purpose of um, this guidance is to assist Australian companies to identify and understand their modern slavery risks, um, assist them to effectively respond to the Modern Slavery Act, um, but also to situate all of this within a broader human rights framework. Um, and our guides are, are grounded in the Austra Australian government's Modern Slavery um, Act guidance, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more um, from Alex later, and also this process known as human rights due diligence, which is outlined in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which is the global authoritative um, standard when we're thinking about um, identifying and managing and addressing um, business-related uh, human rights harms. Um, and before I just jump into some of these more practical steps, I think it's important just to, to note that when we're talking about human rights due diligence, we're talking about a risk management process that that really puts people at the centre. And so we're talking here about risk to people, not so much risk to business, which will be a, a shift in thinking and mindset for probably for many in the room. Um, but often, of course, there'll be points of intersection when we're looking at risk to people and, and also risk to the business. So what are some of the steps outlined in the <clears throat> guidance, excuse me, and what does this mean for anti-money laundry, um, laundering and financial crimes practitioners? Well, at a very high level, the guidance outlines a, a number of practical steps and they include um, identifying and prioritising um, modern slavery risks, um, taking actions to assess, manage and, and address these modern slavery risks and in impacts, looking at um, measuring and, and monitoring the effectiveness of these responses, and finally, when a harm occurs, um, providing remediation. Um, as we heard from, from Ambassador Manton, modern slavery is a, a multi-billion dollar industry, and of course these profits um, move through the global financial system. So within these steps, there's absolutely a role for AML and financial crime um, responses and tools at, at every step. So, for example, uh, during the initial risk identification and, and mapping process, um, tracking financial flows, uh, conducting forensic accountment, accounting is going to be particularly important. Um, there are a number of um, red flags and typologies and indicators that, that are out there that can assist in these process processes and a number of organisations have developed and are um, starting to develop such things. Some of you in the room may be aware of the work that's being done by the Australian Banking Association to develop red flags and typologies for the Australian banking sector and this is something that um, we talk about in our, in our guide. Um, Anti-money laundering and financial crime teams also have a role to play in the ongoing monitoring and um, management of human rights, um, modern slavery risks through ongoing um, screening, analysis and monitoring of um, customer behaviours, financial patterns and, and also um, account information. And we'll talk a little bit more about rem remedy later, but of course um, there's clearly a role for engaging with, as we've already heard from Ambassador Manton, um, law enforcement around ensuring accountability for, for when harms occur. So I'll wrap up by just saying I think despite the critical importance of um, financial crime and any anti-money laundering um, tools and, and responses, it's important to remember that this approach alone will not um, solve the issue for a particular company or, or the sector as a whole. And this really needs to be sit, situated within a broader and coordinated um, modern slavery risk management ecosystem. And I think that's really um, where the, the FAST initiative that, that we've already heard mentioned a few times is, is really practical and valuable because it provides a blueprint that outlines this really um, coordinated and holistic response of what the financial sector should be doing and all the various points of intersection in terms of modern slavery risks. So I'll leave it there.
Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that really helpfully uh, situates for us the fact that there are intersections here between the kinds of risk identification and management processes we see in the, uh, the broader compliance area and infrastructure, but also some new challenges here, shifting the gaze from risks to business to a broader concept of risk to people is, is fundamentally going to require a little bit of rethinking of how we use some of those tools and what that means for the different types of reporting. So not only in the context of SMRs, but specifically under the modern slavery regime. Now, we're, we're very honoured to have with us today Alex Coward, who was a key player in setting up the Modern Slavery Act. And Alex, I wanted to, uh, to come to you that the government was extremely clear uh, in setting up the system that it does apply to financial services and that financial services entities are expected where they meet the other threshold tests to report not only, for example, on their supply chains of their, say, janitorial cleaning services or their computers, but also their investments, their lending, their deposit taking, their transactions. Um, we've now been through some reporting, as Ambassador Manton mentioned, we've got something like, I think she said 2,700 reports now. What are we seeing in terms of financial services reporting? Do anti-money laundering and anti-financial crime tools feature prominently in what they're reporting they're doing to meet their Modern Slavery Act obligations? Over to you. Thanks, James, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so here in Australia, uh, we've seen large financial institutions, particularly uh, the major banks, uh, coming out of the, the starting blocks pretty well uh, in terms of their first reports under the Act. Uh, and that's important because in the early days of, of similar legislation overseas, uh, particularly the United Kingdom, we, we saw very weak reporting from the financial sector. Uh, and so a, a basic um, point of comparison, some of the first statements from uh, major banks under UK legislation uh, in 2016 were kind of coming out around four or five pages. Uh, and, and that pleasingly hasn't been the case here. So. Uh, most of the, the major bank statements uh, under our legislation here are around 15 to 20 uh, pages in length. And, and that gives you, even at that level, a good sense of the difference in detail that, that we're seeing uh, here in Australia. And uh, there's a few things that, that banks here have, have done really well, particularly uh, around some of those AML CTF tools and, and integration that has, has helped with those statements. Uh, and so firstly, uh, I think from day one, banks compared to other sectors uh, in Australia have, have recognised that, as James said, they can be involved in modern slavery in, in a whole range of ways beyond just the products and services in their corporate supply chain, like the IT or uh, the paper that they might buy for their offices. Uh, and here, of course, we're, we're talking especially about recognising there may be potential modern slavery risks linked to their customers and, and their investments, which uh, is where some of these AML and NAFC tools come in. And, uh, perhaps a, a key driver there has, has been that, uh, of course, the, the banking and, and financial services sector has been very conscious of, of issues like child sexual exploitation for uh, a number of years and, and have been able to bring some of the learnings from uh, combating that, that particular subset of, of modern slavery uh, into this broader space. Uh, banks, too, have, have been good uh, at integrating and embedding their modern slavery responses into their broader risk work, and, and Sarah mentioned before how important it is that, that this isn't just uh, something that's done in isolation. And uh, so, for example, in terms of AML uh, tools and techniques, we're, we're seeing banks integrate modern slavery uh, considerations and, and red flags into customer due diligence. We're, we're seeing um, banks looking at ESG risks as well in terms of their lending and, and investments. Uh, and of course, recognizing that money laundering is really closely associated with modern slavery as a particularly profitable crime. And so some of the work that, that banks are doing around money laundering lends itself really well to uh, also picking up modern slavery crimes. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, in terms of things banks have, have done well, we, we've seen, I think, a, a really high degree of, of openness to uh, collaboration, whether that's uh, between um, the banking sector and, and government within the banking sector. And, and Sarah mentioned uh, some of the collaborative work there. Uh, and some, for example, there's a, a statement from a major bank that uh, talks about how some of the financial information that uh, they were able to provide to Australian regulators uh, helped identify um, not just financial crimes, but also underlying foreign worker exploitation, uh, which could well have led to situations of modern slavery. 
Um, so that being said, well, there's lots that, that banks are doing well uh, in modern slavery reporting. And, and I think um, some great work thinking around uh, how AML and CTF tools have a role to play. Uh, there's also some areas for, for improvement. Uh, and Sarah, again, has, has mentioned remediation, which uh, I know we'll come back to. But uh, two other areas, uh, I think, are um, banks focus today on, on customer-related risks. So perhaps, again, looking at some of the, the child sexual exploitation issues that the banks have been traditionally dealing with, we've seen a lot of statements from banks talking about customer risks. And, and we've seen less engagement and, and less information about commercial lending and, and investment activities. And that's an important area because that's a, another area where we know uh, from past experience that the financial sector can be exposed to a whole range of, of human rights impacts. And uh, some of the global work that's been done on this through the, the Financial Sector Commission on, on Modern Slavery has really highlighted the need for banks to think about how they use their leverage creatively uh, to address modern slavery risks in, in that space. Uh, and then secondly is, is thinking about effectiveness. So uh, a key part of the Modern Slavery Act is that not only do businesses like banks and, and other financial sector, sector institutions need to report on their actions to uh, assess and address modern slavery risks, but also how they're assessing the effectiveness of, of those actions. And, and of course, that uh, can be a, a much bigger conversation in the, the AML CTF space, but uh, it's really important that we see uh, banks and, and other organizations starting to move from looking just at at outputs, so number of people trained or um, number of new screening processes implemented to uh, reporting on outcomes as well. So uh, did those new processes help you better identify modern slavery risks, for example? Uh, so in some, uh, we're off to a, a good start, James, but uh, plenty of work uh, left as well for future reporting. Thanks, Alex. That That's extremely helpful. Um, there's a great emphasis, of course, here on, on the new expectations facing uh, financial services and other companies as a result of the Australian Modern Slavery Act. But this is, of course, an Australasian conference. So, Lisa, I wanted to come to you to help us put this in slightly broader regional perspective. We don't yet have a Modern Slavery Act in New Zealand, although I know you're working very hard to change that. Do we see a growing awareness in the region of the role that the financial sector could potentially play to, to tackle uh, this problem and how, g given the region, in some parts of the region, the, the sector looks a bit different than it does in Australia. There's more government participation as a commercial actor, for example. How do the, do the balance of responsibilities between governments and private business break down in this region? Thanks very much, James. And I'm really pleased to be on this panel with uh, such an esteemed uh, number of individuals who have already given uh, you so much uh, detail and information this morning on the issues of uh, modern slavery in the finance sector. But thanks also to ACAMS for inviting me, representing Walk Free, to be here today. I think to go to your question, James, there's definitely a lot happening in the region and there's a lot more awareness in the region. But uh, coming obviously here in Sydney, um, you know, speaking in Australia, I've been very much um, an advocate for Australia to be a, a leader in the region. So I think just firstly to, to look at some of the aspects of what the Ambassador uh, for Human Trafficking and People Smuggling, Modern Slavery, Lucy Ann Matten, picked up on, and that is our Australian Modern Slavery Act, which only came into effect in 2018, and this is the first year that... Uh, entities will be reporting under that Act. It's still got a bit of time to play out, but I know that there are a number of, of um, governments in our region that are actually watching and waiting to see particularly some of the assessment work that will go into the modern slavery statements, um, you know, what that sort of reporting will look like in terms of whether, it, whether or not it will change the dial and actually address... Um, and end to some of the issues that we talk about under the umbrella term of modern slavery, be it forced, forced labour, human trafficking, uh, uh, debt bondage and the like. So first there's the Australian Modern Slavery Act and, of course, then, James, you picked up on, on our, our neighbours over the ditch. So for Walk Free, we've been working pretty strongly with uh, the New Zealand government and New Zealand businesses 
on whether or not they see themselves as the next Commonwealth nation to introduce a modern slavery act. I'm pleased to say that um, uh, just last week uh, the minister launched a new leadership advisory group to actually move move that forward, um, which I'm pleased to be part of, uh, along with another, a number of other New Zealand uh, businesses and, and organisations. So they're definitely interested and have been watching Australia in that space. But then we need to look, I think, further in the region. And, and this is where it is really, really heartening to see some of the activities potentially, well, actually in Southeast Asia, for example, with, with Thailand, who have introduced a national action plan on, on business and human rights. Further, we're seeing activities with stock exchanges in the region, Thailand again being one of those who want to actually look at um, sustainability reporting uh, as part of, um, of their stock exchange process. I think also though, um, you know, and this is of course addressing human rights and labour conditions um, when, we're, when we're focusing on that. But I think while we've been encouraged by some of these actions, I do think that there is more that could be done. And this is where organisations like ACAMS and FAST uh, I think certainly have a role to play using those some of those existing frameworks like the Modern Slavery Act to sort of go a bit further. And this is, I think, what I like to call the ripple effect of the Modern Slavery Act. You know, we, we've had this incredible sort of awakening, uh, you know, we're all a bit woke now uh, about, you know, the, the, the impact of, um, you know, the, the goods we purchase, uh, where we invest our money, uh, you know, the, the, the supply chains that are connected to, you know, goods and services that we all use every day. But what does this sort of mean in terms of the finance sector per se and what sort of role can the finance sector play of course, we know they play a role through the Modern Slavery Act, but over and above that, I think this is where FAST and ACAMS uh, come, in, come directly to be involved through this sort of ripple effect. So I'm really pleased to see that the IAST, Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking, to be the sort of latest example in the space of where the finance sector can play a, a direct role. And th this is about taking, you know, again, more action within existing frameworks, but it's about Australian-based investors who are saying that our reporting involves us knowing more about the companies that we are investing in. And that is really, really refreshing. Um, and I think we've seen some of this already, James, in the climate space, um, you know, for, for some time in terms of investment. But we haven't seen it in the in the human rights sort of you know labour conditions, the forced labour space, and that's that's the role of IAST. Of course, over and above that, speaking more generally in the region, there is ongoing activity that the ambassador mentioned to do with the Bali process. Walk Free is very very proud to be a, a secretariat of the Bali Process Government and Business Forum that she referred to. You know, it's a unique forum where you've got 45, uh, you know, ministers and, and business leaders sitting around a table together talking about the impact of human trafficking, modern slavery within the region and, and what they are all going to commit to and do about it. Uh, the AAA recommendations that came out of that, that first uh, um, government and business forum meeting, Bali process meeting, all of those recommendations are still sort of, you know, current and and alive today as, as they were in 2018 when they were put forward. So I encourage you to go on the IAST.org website, uh, the Bali Process Government and Business Forum website and the FAST website um, because there's so much resources there and the Australian Human Rights Commission's website. There are so, much, so many resources and tools for business in the finance sector there. Walk Free also on our website has a business and investor toolkit as well. So lo lots going on in the region. Australia should continue to play a leading role. Uh, just because we introduced a Modern Slavery Act doesn't mean it's game over. There's still a lot we need to do and need to encourage and support countries like New Zealand but also other countries in Southeast Asia who are equally trying to do as much, I think, as we are. 
Thanks, Lisa. And I think that's a great segue also, the, the note that there are resources available to maybe come back to our video, which I believe we have on standby. So this is the Fast ACAMS training certificate on taking action on modern slavery uh, through your AML CFT system. Cross my fingers. When we launched the certificate course in modern slavery and human trafficking, there was a statement made which I think really encapsulated my passion for this. And that was banks and other financial institutions cannot stop modern slavery and human trafficking. But modern slavery and human trafficking will not be stopped without the involvement of banks and other financial services. I think what ACAMS uh, have done for the movement in the modern day slavery it's going to be historical. I think you guys have laid the foundation for financial institutions uh, to follow your lead. Uh, you also created a first level of awareness globally, which was very, very needed. You can't fight human trafficking if you don't understand the crime. I've been delighted to work with, with ACAMS over the last year and a half to bring the uh, fast blueprint, the blueprint for mobilizing finance against slavery and trafficking that was published by the Financial Sector Commission back in September 2019 to bring it to life through an online training certificate that FAST and ACAMS jointly published in the middle of 2020. We've been just blown away by the response to that certificate. Human trafficking and modern slavery is a predicate offense to money laundering and thankful for the ACAMS and um, them pursuing the FAST, the Finance Against um, Slavery and Trafficking um, project. And so I'm saying that the human trafficking certificate that ACAMS is providing is a really good help in terms of its program and bringing it to the fore and in having persons understand that this is a serious problem that we need to address on an ongoing basis. I do very much welcome ACAMS initiative uh, with the certificate, which has really contributed significantly to raising awareness. My name is Scott Lyles, and I'm proud to lead a global effort to detect and end modern day slavery and human trafficking. We can only stop the crime if we follow the money. Thank you so much, co uh, technical colleagues, for letting us see that. So as you can see there, very practical tools available. You can take the course free uh, at your own speed. And as you read there, some 10,000 uh, AML professionals, AFC professionals worldwide, have taken the course in the last year since it's been available. Uh, and interestingly, Australia is the number three country. Uh, so the number one country is US, then India, interestingly, and, and then Australia. And actually, if you look at the top 10, about two thirds of the top 10 are countries in this region, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region more broadly. So there's clearly a real thirst for those practical resources. And I wanted to note also, Lisa, what you were just saying, that there's this new initiative that Walk Free has helped stand up called Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking, APAC, uh, with some 35 institutional investors with around, I think it's currently uh, about 5.7 trillion AUD assets under management involved in this collaborative effort. And I'm not going to ask the panel to speculate on why we see investors moving on this, but not necessarily banks moving in the same way. That would be a little unfair, not least because, Sarah, you mentioned there is some work being done by the Australian Banking Association, for example, around typologies. But what I think it does show is there's a real need for practical tools and for collaboration to think about what is possible. And one area that you mentioned, Sarah, uh, where, we, where the global expectations are that there is action by banks and investors is around remedy, um, but also a need for real learning collaboratively to understand what, what does that actually uh, look like. So let me ask you that question. What, what do markets, what do the international norms expect of, let's say, banks? Let's keep it to that narrow uh, scope for the moment in terms of remediating the harms from that arise from the conduct of their customers, for example. What, what are we really expecting there 
Um, and is there a danger that in asking the banks to report on these risks, it actually discourages them from getting too involved in remedy? Thanks, James, and congratulations to um, FAST and ACAMS also for the um, online um, module. I've had a look at the curriculum and it um, has covered all of the topics that we're covering today and more, so really encourage everyone to, to have a look at that. But um, back to the topic at, at hand and the issue of, of remedy and, and the role of banks, and I think this has been a topic that um, has been debated quite extensively um, at the international um, policy level, um, but I think what it has also led is to some crystallisation around the expectations there. But I think it's also just important to remember the importance of this talk topic when we're talking about access to remedy because I think when we're talking about modern slavery and we're talking about risk factors and following the money and tracking financial flows, I think it's easy to forget that we're talking about actual people here and it's people that are being exploited um, and abused and, and controlled. And so I think it's just important to, to keep that in mind. And yes, prevention should be at the heart of every and any response, but we live in a, in a complex world and, and gaps exist and, you know, these harms do and continue to take place and, and that those that are um, in situations of exploitation and, and modern slavery really need um, some form of access to, to remedy. So what is this term remedy that you keep hearing being thrown around? I'm sure there's probably lots of lawyers in the room. I'm also guilty of being one. Um, I think for lawyers, when we think about the term remedy, we think about litigation and legal liability. But if I bring it back to this framework that I was mentioning before, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, we're talking about a concept that's actually much broader. It's about restoring people to the position they were in before the harm occurred or as, or as close as possible to that because it's often not always possible. So yes, financial compensation could be part of that, but so could non-financial compensation, apologies, you can't underestimate the power of an apology, um, restitutions, guarantees of um, uh, future um, uh, prevention of future harms and, and also um, sanctions which have been talked about but you know, there's clearly a role for, for law enforcement um, to, to, to play there. So um, I think it's useful to think about this broad, broader notion of, of remedy and it's not just around legal liability and, and lawsuits um, and extensive litigation. Um, so then what is expected of, of banks and, and other um, financial um, and other reporting entities? Well, the um, Australian government's Modern Slavery Act guidance also draws on, on the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights and it outlines that... Um, a company or, or a bank can cause, contribute or be um, directly linked to, to a modern slavery um, risks or, or impacts and depending on um, the relationship to that harm, that will determine the level of responsibility in, in remediating the harm. So um, the expectation is that a com if a company causes uh, a human rights harm. Um, it should take the necessary steps to um, prevent and, and mitigate the harm and, and play a direct role in providing remediation. Um, where it contributes to that harm, it should take steps to cease or prevent its contribution, use its leverage to, to mitigate any further harm and also play a role in, provide, in um, providing remediation. And then finally, where a um, bank has not caused or contributed but is directly linked to a harm through its um, relationships, um, products or services, there's not a direct expectation to provide remediation, although the company is, of course, you know, more than um, is able to do so. Um, but the expectation and the international level is really that the company will use its leverage where possible um, to prevent and, and mitigate the harm. So I think it's important to remember that um, these aren't three clear-cut 
cut categories and um, companies can really, um, it's, a, it's a spectrum of activity and depending on the acts or emissions of a company, they more, may fall into um, the different categories which will of course have implications for the role in terms of responsibility. Um, but just to come back to your final point, James, um, so I don't, I don't personally think there is a danger of expecting banks to be involved in re remedy, but I do think there is a fear about being transparent and that fear of um, is, of course, being driven by um, risks around reputation and, and legal liability. I think, as Alex has already flagged, um, reporting under the UK Modern Slavery Act has been, from the Australian banks, has been pretty light and I'm sure that fear has been, has been driving that process. Um, in other sectors, I think we've seen companies be braver and be more open about their risks. Um, Nestle, for example, admitted that they found um, forced labour in their fishing supply chains in, in Thailand. Now, the sky didn't fall in for that company. In fact, they were actually applauded um, by many sectors of various communities, whether it's civil society and, and invest in investors and, and others. So I think what we're seeing now is that those companies that, that know and show that they understand their modern slavery risks um, are being becoming more respected by civil society, by consumers, and as Lisa already flagged, um, also the investor community. So I think probably the real danger is around failing to um, be transparent and failing to actually disclose that you understand your company's um, modern slavery risks and, and potential impacts. Thanks, Sarah. It sounds like there's a real learning process that, that not only the sector but uh, the broader community is going through here to understand what practical steps to address these risks look like. And it's interesting that in, it's in Australia that, and, and the region that some of these more abstract risks are maybe becoming a little bit pointy, if I can put it that way. So uh, you mentioned this, this continuum of uh, connection to underlying human rights harms that we sometimes see with banks. And there's a, an important, uh, it's called an instance, but it's essentially a case here in Australia where ANZ uh, worked in the context of the OECD national contact point, more jargon, but that's basically a conciliation service provided by the Department of Treasury, interestingly, where somebody alleges that a company is connected to a human rights harm. Um, in this case, the allegation had to do with uh, displacement from land for sugar industry in Cambodia, which had been funded by ANZ. And ANZ reached a settlement in that case, uh, which involved no, no admission of liability, but a substantial payment uh, to remediate the underlying harm. Uh, so, again, these are not necessarily ab purely abstract notions. They are coming to pass and they're having quite significant, if we connect that up to the Westpac, Austrac settlement as well, quite significant financial implications uh, for these companies. Uh, which brings me to a question to you, Alex. You've been patiently waiting. Thanks for, for staying with us. Uh, which is about really the, the strategic nature of these risks. You know, it's easy with all this jargon which we've been adding to this morning to treat this as quite a technical compliance exercise. But we are beginning to see in certain cases these risks are realised in a way that has strategic implications for an organisation. Does that mean we need C-suite involvement uh, in, these, in these kinds of processes? And while you're pondering your answer to that, I'm just going to encourage the audience to send in some questions. We have a couple on Slido, but now will be a great time. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes for for answers to your questions. Back to you, Alex. Do we need C-suite involvement? Thanks, James. Um, so the, the short answer is uh, an absolute yes. Uh, and let me talk you through the, the process of, of getting there. Um, so we've, we've certainly seen some businesses treat reporting under uh, the Modern Slavery Act or, or other legislation overseas as a, a technical compliance exercise. It, it's a matter of um, putting some, some nice sounding words on, on a piece of paper uh, and and, and publishing that. And um, well, that can be a, a, an understandable temptation. I, I think it's um, always a, a poor strategic uh, decision and, and particularly uh, for, for the banking sector. And 
as as the panel said, when we we're thinking about the the strategic dimension of of modern slavery risks, uh, it, it's really important to uh, look to the world of tomorrow, uh, and and that world is really starting to change quite quickly, not just uh, in the area of, of of modern slavery, but in this whole sphere of uh, ESG risks, so environmental, social, and and governance risks, and and modern slavery being uh, one of the the ways that social risks can can impact banks. Uh, and so even just in the last few weeks, for example, we've seen um, new business and human rights legislation in, in Norway uh, and in Germany. The uh, entire European Union regulatory landscape is, uh, is moving towards uh, mandatory human rights due diligence. And, and many of you in the room will either do business in Europe or you'll lend to companies in Europe or you'll have uh, other customers in Europe. Uh, the US is, is uh, talking about action uh, in this space as well. Uh, and there's a whole suite of, of changes uh, taking place uh, around the world and really as as banks uh, and other financial services institutions, um, no one can afford to ignore that those changes mean, as, as James said, that um, some of these issues and some of these risks are, are becoming a, a lot pointier and uh, we're starting to see uh, increased litigation as, as well, uh, particularly in, in countries like the United Kingdom around business and human rights. And so while all of this can sometimes sound a, a little bit fluffy and, and theoretical, uh, there's a, a really real practical dimension to it, an increasing chance that uh, over the coming months and, and years, uh, your board and your C-suite are, are going to have to be asking questions around, well, are we exposed to risks in this way? Um, what do we do if, for example, as James said, the Australian National Contact Point knocks on our door and, and says, look, um, we've had a complaint made against you, or uh, if a regulator comes to you and, and says, look, we're looking at, at transactions uh, through your systems, um, banks need to be prepared for that. And, and that's an issue that you can only really at a level, uh, through the C-suite and, and through the board. And um, and that's in part too, because it's an issue that, that cuts completely across uh, a bank's operations. So one of the, the big challenges that I think for banks thinking about modern slavery risks is uh, if you're operating like some of Australia's majors in, in 14 or 15 countries, uh, you have a huge network of, of operations uh, that, that are really different and, and diffused and, and you have to grasp and, and understand those. And that kind of understanding is, is only going to come if it's uh, driven from the top down. And uh, so there's a real role for boards and, and C-suites here in, in understanding the risks and understanding how those risks fit into uh, broader uh, risks for the, the business, particularly uh, in the financial crime space. And, and I think one of the key challenges and, and perhaps something that um, people in the the room can can take away is, is to think about well how do we make sure that our our directors uh, and our C suite are, are equipped to actually have these conversations uh, and and think about this in in a strategic way and so there's a a huge challenge I think for a lot of Australian businesses in every sector uh, to to make sure that they have people either on their boards in their C suite or, or they have access to uh, people with with the knowledge and, and understanding to have conversations about things like remediation uh, that may not have been matters that have been front and centre before, but, but are going to be uh, if they're not already over the next few years. Thanks, Alex. Uh, you described there, Alex, quite a rapidly changing uh, regulatory landscape, particularly with the um, potential arrival of mandatory human rights due diligence in Europe. Um, Lisa, coming to you, here in Australia, there are also calls, for example, for uh, a ban on imports of goods made with forced labour. Just this week, uh, the you'll correct me if I get the name wrong, that the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Subcommittee, uh, just committee, there we go, I knew I wouldn't get it quite right, um, had a, a multi-partisan, not just bipartisan, but all parties backed the uh, creation of a, of a law with such import bans, at least for Uyghur, uh, made forced labour goods. Um, does this mean that that this is becoming not just a compliance issue, but really a source of political risk and even financial risk for companies in Australia? Is there a risk with that kind of uh, move afoot and the the G7's attention to these issues that that's going to show up in the in the accounts of some of the the banks and other reporting entities here today? Thanks, James. Yeah, there's a lot that's gone on in the last week um, in this space. Um, and I think obviously there's a lot of attention globally at the moment um, that we're seeing in terms of trade bans, in terms of customs bans that are deeply embedded in the geopolitics that is going on right now. 
But ultimately, I'm not sure it's about political risk for companies. Uh, I think it is more about companies reporting on due diligence and compliance. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, you need to look at what are the consequences of of these companies not reporting on their supply chains? What sort of reputational risk does that leave them exposed to? I think everyone in the human rights movement, though, is happy to see companies talking and taking action on forced labour. And we get that this is in turn because of those sorts of geopolitical movements going on right now. So, you know, the fact that there is more attention because of that I don't think is a bad thing, um, but the outcomes are strengthening resolve to address forced labour and I think that is what we need to focus on rather than the geopolitics. Um, you know, and I think that this is where some good outcomes are coming out of the two. So Canada, for example, is a good example recently of um, a new customs ban they've put in place. In terms of um, the the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, as it's short, shortly known, that part, that put, handed down a report last week uh, in terms of Australia looking into this space. That report obviously was out of an inquiry into a, a piece of legislation that was put up by an independent senator, Rex Patrick, that actually just wanted a customs ban on China. Um, the the committee you know, rightly in, in, in our view, um, reported that if Australia is going to look at a customs ban, it should be country agnostic. It should look at a customs ban for all, any country that, that may be uh, associated with forced labour. Uh, but then it did go more specifically, obviously, into, you know, some specific forced labour issues at the moment in terms of cotton in, in, in Xinjiang. Um, uh, what it what it proposed though is that the legislation that it was asked to inquire into should be amended. So the, and the amendments should should outline a couple of those recommendations I just mentioned. I think that legislation though, even whether it goes forward in its amended form, has a long way to play out here in Australia. It, we have to put this into perspective. It is one individual senator's private senator's bill. Um, I know from my own time in the Senate. There's only, I think, a, um, about an hour a week during a Senate sitting period that you can debate such bills. So I, I think there's a long long way for something like this to play out. But having said that, it was good that uh, the Australian government, uh, Walk Free, uh, a number of um, organisations fed into that process. Probably my colleagues are around here with me as well, James. Um, and, and we we made our voices heard in terms of what 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 we think customs bans should look like. You know, should we go down the U.S. tariff act sort of path? Should we look at what Canada's just done? So, if all of that's come about because of geopolitics in the region, then I don't think that's a bad thing because it, again, we are all talking about the impact of of forced labour on on the goods and services that are imported into Australia every day. So that's a good thing. But I think in terms of how it's all going to sort of pan out going forward, it's got a long way to go. Thank you, Lisa. All right, we have about 10 minutes for, uh, for some answers to the questions that come in. So please keep sending them in on Slido. I'm going to kick us off with a question. I'm going to combine two great questions actually here that are both have to do with supply chains. So this is a question to the whole audience, whoever you know hits their buzzer, for, uh, to the whole panel, I should say, whoever hits the, the buzzer first can go first. Um, the first is from Julian Fenwick. Apologies, Julian, if I mispronounce your name as somebody else with a difficult uh, to pronounce last, last name, I feel your pain. Um, when analyzing supply chains, how many layers should we review? And then the second question is from Luke Raven. Um, there are many private companies which purport, it's a great word, purport to accredit supply chains as exploitation free. What do we think of them? And are they themselves monitored or assisted by a government or the government in any way? So, Alex, maybe I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. Um, how far down the supply chain and, and are assurance and audit companies worth the money? Slight paraphrasing, but I think that's the gist of it. 
They're both, uh, <clears throat> both great questions. And, and so uh, in terms of how far uh, to look, the uh, guidance accompanying the, the legislation and, and the government uh, have always been pretty clear that they understand that this is uh, a process of continuous improvement for, for businesses. And so most businesses have, including banks, have come to this with some visibility of, of tier one and, and really no visibility beyond that. And so the expectation under the Act is that uh, initially businesses will be talking about risks primarily at that tier one level, but that uh, over time they will drill down, particularly where they think there may be particular areas of risks into uh, those deeper tiers of, of their supply chain. And, and that's really important. So uh, again, for those of you in the room um, who, are, who are working on, on these reports, uh, you don't want to be here um, in another two years saying, well, look, we, we know about our tier one supply chain, but we don't really have a sense of what's beyond that because often uh, it is those lower tiers where the, the greater risks are, are present. So it is really important to be thinking about those and, and even at this stage to be showing that you're aware of, of where those risks uh, may be. Um, in terms of private uh, accreditation, um, there's a, a much bigger conversation, I think, around the role of, of technology uh, in this space. And, and a lot of these accreditation solutions use technology in, in various ways. Uh, and so um, on the one hand, they, they can be helpful in, in helping businesses understand a little bit more about their supply chain. But uh, I don't know that there's any business uh, or any provider that could uh, guarantee that a supply chain is, is slavery free or an area or its operations are slavery free. And uh, I think stakeholders would, would rightly be quite skeptical of, of those claims. So um, potentially helpful in, in some circumstances, but by no means a silver bullet. Thanks, Alex. Sarah, is this something you'd care to comment on? Are there circumstances where that kind of social audit may not be a viable option, for example? Yeah, I think um, Alex has kind of touched on the limitations to, say, social audits or um, accreditation processes. Um, and I think probably a really good example that's used quite a lot is around, many of you will be familiar with the Rana Plaza um, building collapse in Bangladesh in 2013 that um, – killed many, many people and injured many, many more. That building actually um, uh, only a few weeks before went through its audit process and it, you know, had ticks all along the way and then, you know, tragedy followed. So I think um, they audits do have a, a role to play but it's important to remember that um, often they're only a snapshot in time. There's power balances that, that may be at play. For example, workers in a particular um, facility might not feel comfortable um, speaking openly um, and or visits might be, you know, pre-announced. Um, so, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, thinking and writing out there around around the limits of audit processes doesn't mean they don't have the role it's just uh, have a role to play it's just important to to keep this in mind and i think just to come back to alex's point particularly if you're investing in or supplying from high risk well known high risk sectors or countries and someone comes to you and says they found no exploitation i think yeah we would all be pretty um, skeptical about that so i think um, it's important to understand where the high risks are in your operations um, also and supply chains, and then it allows you to ask the right questions of um, auditors. I think to add to that, I think just because you've engaged a, an auditor, however good their own reputation may be, it doesn't mean job is done. And I think this is where, you know, this is this is going to be an evolving process. I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see in terms of the modern slavery statements that have come in this year, some near 3,000 now, uh, to, to compare them to, to what they'll look like in a year's time. But, uh, you know, I, th I think this is where we're very unique in Australia because, as Alex knows, because he played such a key role, the Modern Slavery Act in Australia has a publicly available modern slavery register where anyone can go online and look up a company's modern slavery statement. And some of those that we've had a look at so far that have come in, it's been really heartening to see some of them go beyond tier one and actually want to go and dig a bit deeper. And I think if, if other companies can learn from those companies over time, then it's only going to strengthen our resolve to end forced labour and, and achieve what the Modern Slavery Act set out to do in the first place. So I encourage you to all 
in your spare time, go on the Modern Slavery Register and ha have a look at some of those really good statements that are on there. Thank you all. Um, there are some fantastic questions coming in. Thank you. We're not going to get through all of them. I just want to pull out a couple that we won't answer and then give you one as a panel to answer uh, at the end. Um, one great question that I'm going to flick to the panel tomorrow on utilities is um, would due diligence utilities be a good idea here? So could we envisage uh, a cooperative approach around due diligence on these issues? Um, perhaps that's something that could be discussed tomorrow. I have to mention a question here that mentions Piketty because I think anybody who mentions Thomas Piketty in a question at a, at a compliance conference deserves some kind of prize. Um, and the, essentially the question here, and panel feel free to take this if you want to, is are we at risk of repeating historical mistakes of basically externalizing the costs onto the victims if we don't get this right? But the question I am going to ask you in minute each is what would effective government industry cooperation in this area actually look like? What are the practical things that we would like to see this sector doing with government in the near term to advance progress in this area? So Alex, again, I'm gonna throw you on the hot seat. That's the price you pay for sitting in the comfort of your own uh, lounge room, I guess that is. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, look, I, I think um, rather than a, a particular um, initiative or, or idea, <clears throat> um, what is most useful is, I think, open two-way communication and, and a degree of trust. And I think that is what holds back um, in, in any space, government and, and business collaboration. And, and many of you in the room will have seen it in, in the various risk uh, work that you do. And, and so what we need is a, a an environment where, where businesses can feel like they can go to government and, and say, look, here's where we think the biggest risk areas are for us. And, and often that's that's a big thing for a, a business to disclose uh, and to talk about where potential cases might be. And uh, I think for government as well to be willing to engage with that uh, and um, make policy changes and, and other changes where necessary. So that's kind of a, a half answer, um, which I'll, I'll justify on the basis that, that I was going first. But I think ahead of any initiatives or, or particular actions, what, what's really important is, is that kind of two-way conversation. I think government's done a lot of work to facilitate that so far, and, and I think business has been quite open to that, but we really need to see that continue uh, because as um, all the panelists have said, we, we need to find victims and, and support them. Thanks, Alex. Sarah? Um, I think if uh, you all think that companies take a siloed approach to their work. You know, wait till you, I think, deal with, with governments. I think I'd probably like to see a breakdown of silos in this area in both government and on the corporate side and, and bring this together really through um, a holistic and coordinated lens. So having your compliance folk and your legal folk with your procurement, with your ESG and with all the various um, uh, arms of arms of government as well. And just to add to add some more seats on the table, just to make sure that you um, you and both government are engaging with civil society as these discussions play out. And particularly, we haven't really touched on the role of survivors and engaging with survivors in, in shaping these responses. Um, but I think that's also a really critical piece of the puzzle. Lisa? Well, I think government's d done a fair bit in this space already. It's, it has a modern slavery expert advisory group, which has business sitting at the table. I think government has to recognise that it may be the policy makers and setters, but it doesn't have all the answers and it needs to bring those other experts in the field to come to the table. That's what a healthy democracy looks like. And that's why I'm really pleased to see New Zealand now going down that path of creating a similar expert advisory group, which also has business at the table. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you, everyone, for a really rich panel. I think there's a, you can see that this is a rapidly moving and evolving area an area where expectations are quite high, but also risks are very real and becoming crystallised. It's great to see ACAMS taking this leadership in encouraging this conversation. Thank you, Orb. Uh, thank you to everybody, ACAMS globally, who've encouraged reflection and practical action on these issues. And we at FAST look forward to continuing to work with you to advance the conversation. So thank you all very, very much. Please join me in thanking the panellists today.